Well, good morning. Welcome to another Oak City Church live stream. Um, if you're new to us, special welcome to you. Um, or if you've just been checking us out on live stream, but you've never been in this building, um, we're just glad you continue to, to join us. Uh, we want you to know that you're, you're welcome here when we can gather again. Um, I miss, I say it every week, uh, I miss this full room. I miss my church family. I miss hearing your voices as we worship together. And uh, I, don't, I don't know about you, but it was just a, it was a long week, hard week. I don't know if it's the rain or the gloominess or what, but uh, this morning, my soul just needs to worship. Uh, my soul needs to be reminded of the truths of the word, and, um, the truths of these songs that we'll sing together. And so I, I hope that you're encouraged as we worship together. Um, sing loud for your families uh, to remind one another. Uh, sing loud for your neighbors so that they can hear the joy and the hope that is found only in Jesus. So we put, our, we put our identity in him this morning. We put our hope in him as we make great his name. So sing along.
set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. I just want to know your heart better than I've ever known anything. Your heart, I just want to know your heart. I just want to know your heart better than I've ever known anything. Don't hesitate, make it loud and clear, make it loud and clear. Do whatever it takes to let me know you're here, I need to know you're here. So silence the noise with your voice. Your words, your truth, and speak directly to me. Cause I'm listening. I just want to know your heart. I just want to know your heart. I just want to know your heart better than I've ever known anything. Your heart. I just want to know your heart. I just want to know your heart better than I've ever known anything. Your heart, I just want to know your heart. I just want to know your heart better than I've ever known anything. Your heart, I just want to know your heart. I just want to know your heart better than I've ever known anything. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Cause you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh. Let the key of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let 
the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song you are good good oh you are good you're good oh you are good you're good oh yes you are good good It's hard at times to sing that line that you're never going to let me down. But the world thinks you've let us down. So many people around us think that that you failed us or that you don't exist or you don't love us because of sickness, because of grief. But God, the more we the more we dig into you, the more we seek you and we search your heart. Lord, it's in those times of, that we know in grief and sadness, you're the closest. God, we can each look back on our lives and, and see the times that we were just barely holding it together. But most of all, we can see your faithfulness. Lord, and we long for the people around us to know the hope, the joy, even in the worst of circumstances, the joy that's found in you. So teach us this morning to to love our neighbors well, to give of our time, to give of our energy, to give of our things so that others can have the hope of Jesus and the hope of eternal life. So we're going to sing that again this morning with confidence. We're going to sing it over our doubts. That you're good and that you're never going to let us down. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Cause you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Cause you are good, good. Oh, you are good, you're good. Oh, you are good, you're good, you're so good. You are good, good, oh. 
Well, good morning. Thanks for tuning in with us. Uh, for me, it is another good afternoon. It is a good Friday afternoon uh, because we are pre-recording our live stream. This are not quite live stream this week. I do want to start by apologizing on behalf of our live stream team because last week I mentioned that we had done a survey and you guys graded us an eight and a half out of ten on our live stream. And in response to that, we gave you this. Yeah, we gave you um, some bad lighting and Pastor Incredible Hulk. That's what we gave you. That's what one person texted in. Another, another person texted in that we gave you um, Pastor who has been having trouble drinking too much during the coronavirus, which hasn't been true. And then a couple of people mentioned the week before that, that you, we gave you Father uh, incredible Hulk. So we're working hard on this live stream and we know it's, we actually met with a consultant this week uh, because we want this to be really good. We want it to be excellent. And he said, you're doing a great job. And you guys told us we're doing a great job. We know that. We just want it to be as good as, as it can be. And we want that in part because it's, this is, you know, not going to be over next week. And in part because this is a, the, the live stream is going to be a pretty good tool to reach particularly the people that we're pretty good at reaching as a church, which is people that can be a little bit burned on church and have a tough time stepping in the building. And so you may have friends who are like, you know, I'm not quite ready yet. And you can say, well, why don't you, why don't you check out the live stream? Or why don't I come over to your house some Sunday morning and we'll watch the live stream together. And so we want to make this um, really, really good. So thanks for your responses to last week. I got some great maps from people about their their neighbors and some really detailed uh, maps from from folks. I got some good comments. One person said, we're friendly, but we're not friends. I thought that was a really helpful distinction. I got another person that said, we're not friends, we're family. Like we've made a covenant together that we are not going to move unless we both move and we have to go to some type of commune, which is a little weird, but that's good that to have some some neighbors like that. We had some neighbors a few years ago, and they moved and came up and told us, and it felt like a death in the family when they told us that. And hopefully you do have some neighbors over time uh, that are like that. This week, as we move on in the series, I, um, well, I had been thinking this, and then I had a conversation with my mom about it, that one of the best neighborhoods, neighboring group of people that I know is my mom's neighborhood. So my mom moved down three or four years ago from Wisconsin, and when, when she first moved down, she was in an apartment while she's having this place built, and we saw her all the time, and then she moved into this new place, and we haven't seen her since. Like, if you've seen my mom, tell her to check in with us. No, she, she moved into this place, and it's a, it's a 55 and up place that's, that's almost exclusively retired folks, and it's, it's a lot of folks that have moved from other parts of the country because they have adult children just like my mom that are here, so they've got a lot in common, and so last week she was saying, you know, Jeff, I don't, we don't have any problem being good neighbors. Like, I feel like my neighborhood does a great job of this. I'm like, mom, that's because you have nothing else to do. You people are retired, and this, you have all the time in the world to be good neighbors, and that is what I'm going to get to this week because the biggest barrier to being a good neighbor that people cite, and I totally get this, is time. That is the biggest barrier to doing this well. How am I going to have time to be a good neighbor for one more relationship, much less eight relationships, when it just feels like I don't have time for life right now? And I said this at the end of last week, that you really have to trust God to be a good neighbor and to love your neighbor well, because you don't know what you're getting into And you have to trust that he's not going to ask you to do something that is going to completely overwhelm you. Um, And the tension for this week, for me, comes out of the question, if Jesus told us this is the, the most important thing, if he said love God and love your neighbor, like these are the things, if he told us that, is he not going to give us enough time to do the thing that he told us, right? And that's, that's the tension. Uh, Will we trust him for that? Is, is he the problem? Or are we the problem? Is the problem that he's just put too much on our plate? Or is the problem that we do do a great job of using uh, the time that he's given us? And so on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, you've got a few people around you. What, how, would you um, how, how would you rate how well you manage your time on a scale of 1 to 10? Uh, that's a tough question. I, I don't give my help. I'm fairly disciplined in some areas, but in other areas I feel like I'm not. So I don't get a super high grade on that. I'm going to tell you what, when I started thinking about Jesus, rated by today's standards, 
I think Jesus was horrible at managing his time. I think when you look through scriptures in that lens, you're like, oh yeah, he wasn't very good. Now, granted, in three years, he started a ministry that turned like the history of mankind upside down and he saved mankind from their sins. So he got it done, you know? But I think like we're never gonna ask Jesus to give a TED talk on time management because when you look at how he used his time, it's not good, like given how we think about using our time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking out of one passage and reference a few other passages and then, and then talk about what that means for us. So this is Luke chapter eight. If you have a Bible, Luke chapter eight, and we'll, we'll have some of this on the screen. Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus who was a ruler of the synagogue and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored Jesus to come to his house for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age and she was dying. This is actually, Jesus is gonna interrupt his schedule to go deal with this situation. A little girl is dying. That's a great use of his time, you know? We don't know what was being interrupted, but presumably Jesus' agenda is pretty full because he's Jesus and he's important, and so there was something that was being interrupted, but this makes sense. A little girl is, is dying, and if you have a little girl, I have one daughter, she's 14, so not, not a terribly different age. If she's dying, there's nothing, there's nothing else on my agenda. Now, if my sons are dying, because right now I'm sitting with them in the room as I'm talking to you, so that's awkward. But if my sons, boys, if you're dying, same thing. There's nothing else on the agenda, just that the story's about a little girl. But if a little girl is dying, like, that's it. Yeah, that's important enough to break your schedule. And the man, honestly, like, the man is important. He's a ruler of the synagogue. And when you read through the Gospels, Jesus does not connect well with the Jewish leaders. This is a Jewish leader, and I guarantee at least one of his disciples is thinking, you know what, if we help this guy out, then maybe this is going to give us some, a PR boost with the rulers of the Jewish people. This could go a long way. And that's how I say that because that's how we run the equation on where we put our time. We do it like, is it worth it? Is this the maximal use of my time? And Jesus can kill two birds with one stone by going and helping this little girl. And so there's an urgency there. So he goes. Now, it says, as Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all of her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind Jesus, and she touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. So Jesus goes. There's a crowd pressing in on him. This is time critical. There's some tension in that. And this woman comes up, and she's equally desperate. She's had some type of bleeding for 12 years, um, she has spent all of her money on, on physicians and to nothing, and it's nothing. And there's no GoFundMe. You know, this is what, go, we know people like this because this is what it's for, is when your resources are, are done, like getting help, and she, like, it's all, it's all done. And so she comes up behind him, and this is, a, this is actually a pretty cool link to the Old Testament, but she touches the fringe of his garment. Now, in the Old Testament, the fringe of his garment, there was a prayer shawl called a talit, and then the fringe of it was called a zitzit, and it was, it was like having a, it's, it, someone compared it to tying a, a string around your finger to remind you to think about God. And so that's what the fringe of the prayer shawl was to remember God. And there's a, a passage about the Messiah that says when the Messiah comes, he is going to come with healing in his wings. And wings is that same word as fringe, it's zitzit. So her coming up and touching the fringe of his garment is her declaring this is, I believe, that he is the Messiah. He is the one that we've been waiting for. And so Jesus stops and is like, you know, what is this? Because it's this incredible uh, act of faith. And so she's healed. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? And everybody denied it, which is kind of weird, you know, but everyone's like, not me. I didn't touch you. And, and Peter's like, master, the crowd surrounds you. They're pressing in on you. Uh, and Jesus said, somebody touch me, for I perceive that power has um, gone out from me. Now, I think this is a classic distraction of focus. You know, there is a little girl that's dying. Um, Peter's got to be like, we said we would help her. So let's do what we said we're going to do and help her. And it, there's, Jairus is an important guy. And so we can help this important guy. And he's more important than this lady. Like he's got to be thinking of that. And, and who touched me? Is that a real question? Everyone's touching you, Jesus. There's a giant crowd. And, and then what he says, I perceive the power has gone out of me. It's like something Darth Vader says, like the force is strong here when he knows Luke is in the cloud city or whatever it is. Like it's, it's that type of moment. And the woman, when the woman saw that she wasn't hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people 
why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This, this whole interaction takes some time, you know? Like this is not a short conversation and Peter has got to be dying inside of like, man, we got to go help this guy's daughter. But Jesus is totally chilled out in this passage. There is no seeming urgency. There's no pressure. There's no anxiety. There's no like, I know we got to get there. He's just not worried about the next thing on his schedule. And then it says, while he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. And, you know, we all get in, a lot of us, I've had this conversation with a lot of people where you get in a situation where you think, I just can't win. Like there's so many people that want my time and I can't please all of them. And it puts us in some type of despair. Like, have you been there? You know, and it doesn't. He's always in that situation and it doesn't. Jesus hearing this answered him, don't fear, only believe, she'll be well. And he came to the house and let nobody enter the house with him except Peter, John, and James and the father and mother of the child. And everyone's weeping and mourning for her. And Jesus said, don't weep for she's not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him knowing that she was dead. And the, the way that's worded, it seems like the people that are laughing at him are the only people in the house. And the only people in the house are Peter, James, John, mom, and dad. <laughs> like the people really close are like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Uh, and it's just a, it's a weird scene. I, I think you can argue that Jesus had some time management issues. Like he could have like pressed through the crowd, said, guys, clear out the crowd. I got to get to this little girl. The woman with the 12-year bleed, it's probably not like she'll make it another couple hours. He can go back and find her. And he, and he doesn't even need to go back and find her because she touched his garment and she was healed. He doesn't need to have that conversation. If he wants to come back and have that conversation, he can find her because he's Jesus and he knows how to find people. But his priorities seem a little bit out of whack. And this isn't the only time this, it happens all the time to Jesus. One of my favorite stories is um, from John chapter 11, and it's about Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and the siblings, and Jesus is good friends with all of them, and at one point, um, Lazarus is really sick on his deathbed, so they send for Jesus and say, Jesus, Lazarus is really sick. You got to come help him. It's urgency, you know, and it says that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, you know, fill in the blank. You hear that your best friend is sick, you drop everything and you come, you do whatever you can to help them. But the verse says, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Like that to us is not great time management. And then Lazarus dies. And both sisters, like separate interactions when they, when they finally see Jesus, say, hey, if you'd been there, my brother wouldn't have died. You know, both of them do, like this really passive-aggressive language, and then he ends up healing Lazarus. He's a busy guy. I know you're a busy guy. Jesus is a busier guy, and I think we would have dealt with things differently than he would. This story with the little girl ends this way, by taking her hand, but taking her hand, he called, saying, child, arise, and her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given to her to eat, and her parents were amazed, and he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Start reading the Gospels with time in mind and interactions like these, Jesus might be the least efficient person to ever walk the earth. His life is one big, long interruption. Uh, just a couple examples. Blind Bartimaeus, you know, sitting by the side of the road, screaming out to Jesus. And they're like, man, be quiet. It's Jesus. He's really important. He just screams louder. And finally, Jesus is like, hey, bring him over here. We're, you know, we're good. And heals him. Uh, the children, at one point, parents want to, their kid, they want to bring their kids to Jesus. So Jesus will lay hands on them and pray for their children. And who wouldn't? And the disciples are like, those are children. Jesus is too important for that. And Jesus rebukes them and says, let the children come to me and don't hinder them because this is what the kingdom of heaven is like, you know? And kids aren't in a hurry. Uh, and neither is Jesus. He's always taking breaks. He gets baptized and he goes out to the desert for 40 days. After a busy season of ministry with his guys, he says, hey, let's go find a desolate place and, you know, build a fire and hang out and talk for a while. He's always looking for a desolate place. After a uh, time of grief when his cousin is killed, before big decisions, uh, just when he wants to spend time with his father, he's big on getting away to desolate places. You read through that, and how would we rate Jesus on a scale of 1 to 10? How would we rate Jesus in terms of time management? And I guarantee you, we would not rate him very highly 
when it comes to how we look at time. But on a scale of one to 10, how well did Jesus love his neighbor? Like you can't, see, it's Jesus, right? He got a 10. He got a 10. Uh, how, on a scale of one to 10, how well do you manage your time? On a scale of one to 10, how well do you love your neighbor? Jesus wins this thing. Jesus wins it. Uh, and there are a million things to say in this message. It's a series to talk about time, you know, several books, but I don't have that much time to talk about time. So I'm going to say a few things. And the first one is this, that time is a gift from God. Time is a gift from God. Uh, and so this is one psalm that, that speaks to that, Psalm 90. It reads this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From everlasting to, ever, from everlasting, to everlasting, you're God. You, time is yours and whatever we have, you've given to us. And you were before time and after time and outside of time. And time is something that you created. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it's past or as a watch in the night. I was reading one article from Forbes about time and some suggestions about managing time. And one of their suggestions was think about what things will be like a hundred years from now. Like put it in perspective in the midst of whatever it is right now you know you sweep them away as with a flood they are like a dream like grass that is renewed in the morning in the morning it flourishes and re is renewed in the evening it fades and is withers that psalm goes on for all our days pass away under your wrath we bring our years to an end like a sigh the years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80 yet their span is but toil and trouble like life is hard you know they are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. God has, he's gifted you time. He's given you a finite amount of time. He knows what it is. Keep that in mind. And that is part of the path to getting a heart of wisdom. Two significant time-related things happened to me this week on the same day on Wednesday I turned 49 and that's not like I've been 49 for six years you know what I mean no I turned 49 and the clock is ticking and it's now 363 days until I turn can we take a break for a second uh, until I turn 50 40 did not seem to be a big deal to me 50 is probably going to require some therapy and on Wednesday, I had uh, my youngest son graduated from, from elementary school and my daughter graduated from, from middle school. And those aren't, you know, these things, those aren't big graduations. For us, um, elementary school, we've been at that school for 12 years. And so that was kind of hard. Like we didn't get a proper chance to say goodbye to some people who have meant a lot to us and to our kids for a long time. And these grade school <laughs> graduations the, we've had three of them, you know, and we kind of missed the one this year. I get surprisingly sentimental at these things. Like, I tear up at these things. And, um, and we didn't have one this year. Instead, they sent a, um, they sent a slideshow that was a half an hour slideshow because it's, it's six years with the same kids. Like, that, I think, is the, the emotion behind it. And I couldn't even watch it at home. I had to come to the office and watch it alone because I was kind of a mess <laughs> when I watched it. You know, no more driving the kids to school and walking them in and, you know, walking the halls and chatting with the teachers. My kids used to hold my hand when I, when I walked them into school. No more coming in um, for lunch and hanging out with their friends. No more field trips or volunteering. And I think, did I use that time well? That time is over. Did I use that time well? And really the question is, did I love those people well during the time that God gave me with them? And I, and I didn't love them poorly, but I know I didn't love them as well as I could have. And so those are significant for me. You know, I believe Jesus, he's always submitting to his father. He submitted his schedule to his father. And his father said, listen, this is going to involve a lot of distractions because these people are a mess. And Jesus was like, all right then. Um, and I think that he probably wants us to be more flexible and to stop thinking that we control everything by controlling our schedule. So time is a gift from God. If you don't fight to own your time, 
someone is going to take it from you. And this is the, maybe all ages are like this, but it's the one that we live in. I linked in the weekly to a couple podcasts. One of them had some pretty fascinating things to say about time. This lady wrote a book about doing nothing and uh, you can find it on the weekly, but she, um, she talked about how medieval serfs worked less than we do. Medieval serfs worked less than we do. You know, they worked eight-hour days. They worked half a year. They knew how to work hard and play hard. They took two weeks when they got married and just went off. They would harvest, but then they'd have a party for like a month. Um, they, they knew how to do that, and, and that was stunning to me. She talked about how, in historical perspective, when we stopped measuring productivity and paying people by the task and started paying them by the hour, our relationship with time as a culture changed. So when people moved into the factory, you know, the industrial revolution, then we start measuring things by the hour and it changes everything. You, you kind of measure your value. Ask yourself, do you know, even if your salary, do you know what your hourly wage works out to be? Because we, that's a way that we rate ourselves uh, in our culture and we didn't, we didn't used to do that. It led to this thing called Parkinson's Law. I'd never heard of this. It has nothing to do with the disease, but it says this, work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. Work will expand so as to fill the time available for its completion. And, I, you know, you give somebody a week to do something, it's going to take a week to get it done. You know, give yourself a couple hours, it's going to take a couple hours. Uh, honestly, as somebody who writes sermons most weeks for a living, this was, this was challenging <laughs> because I realized it's more true than I want. And someone has said deadlines spur action, and so there's something to it. But just it just how we think about time and value and, and work. Another thing I read this week, it was about the Great Depression, so a time when a lot of people were out of work. And one of the ways that they created more um, jobs was they cut people's work hours from 40 hours to 30 hours. And so then they could, for every four people they did that to, they could add another employee so they could get more people employed. So, but Kellogg, the serial guy, back in the 30s um, did this. And Kellogg, he's a fascinating story. He discovered cereal by accident. He was cooking granola and left it out overnight by mistake, like wasn't doing his job well and it hardened up and he's like cereal. That's how it happened. And then he became a cereal magnet or whatever. But he he cut people's hours back from 40 hours to 30 hours, but paid them for 35 hours. So, that, so they were still coming out ahead in the deal. And he found that they were so much more productive in the 30 hours than they were in the 40 hours that soon enough he could pay them for the 40 hours and still employ the extra people. Like more is not necessarily more when it comes to time. We don't have a healthy relationship with time in our culture, right? We are never done we're never done. And it plays directly into this idea of loving your neighbor. Because if you're never done with the things that you have to do, then you're never going to have time for this thing that you think, Jesus doesn't, but you think, we think, is an ancillary thing. It makes it hard for us to justify really engaging those relationships with our neighbors. Our inbox is always full. You know, it used to be a few years ago, people would post pictures of their inbox showing empty. No one does that anymore. Two of you do that. You're like, I do that. Nobody does that anymore. You know, um, I said this a few years ago that email was like digital waterboarding and people still mention that to me because they resonated with it. I, I rarely check my inbox at home and that is like a double-edged sword because if I check it and something's in it and I have to do something that I'm busy but I'm valuable because I'm busy. Uh, and if I check it and there's nothing in there that I really have to do, then I'm free to not be busy, but I'm also not very important because there's nothing in there that I should be doing. Like, that's just, I, I feel like that a lot, you know? You think about how much time-saving technology we have right now, how much time your phone hypothetically saves you, you know, the things that you can do on your phone that you couldn't do before. Streaming television, you don't have to wait for it to come on. Most of the time, you can flip through the commercials. You can watch exactly what you want. Zoom. We don't have to travel to have meetings. We can have meetings across the world and just over our computer, how much time that saves us. Amazon. I could order something right now on my phone, and it be here before I finish this sermon. Right? We have that, but, we, but we're the only country in the world where people scream at their microwaves, hurry up. Like, we have more time, but we don't but we have less time. Why is that? Because we have an unhealthy relationship with time. 
should you, do you, but should you feel rushed all the time? Or should you have periods of margin in your schedule that aren't filled? Times that just there's nothing to do. Um, and do you have times like that? And can you rest during times like that? If not, someone is stealing the time that God gave you. Did Jesus have margin in his schedule? Did Jesus have margin in his schedule? Yes. Yeah, he did. Uh, and so um, time is a gift. If we don't fight for it, someone else is going to take it. And a disordered schedule is likely the result of a disordered heart. Someone has termed this hurry sickness, hurry sickness, a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness and overwhelming and continual sense of urgency. Um, may continue a malaise in which a person feels chronically short of time and so tends to perform every task faster and to get flustered when encountering any kind of delay. <laughs> there was a, a book I read, and I've referenced this once or twice, I think, called Leadership Durability. And it was a, it's a pastor that just flat burned out, like his body shut down, burned out. And so he talks about the, the um, physiology of that in this thing called adrenal fatigue, which is being researched, and some people aren't, don't agree with it, but there's some science behind it of your adrenal glands that produce cortisol. When you, when you face constant either distress or eustress, they're always working, and eventually they stop working the way that they're supposed to be working, and you, you stop having the ability to deal with stress the way that you're supposed to be you know, dealing with stress. And when you're living like that, like constantly on, your emotional margin to engage your neighbors, man, it suffers. And so this guy goes through, why did he get to that place? You know, what was going on in his heart? And he said, I'm burning out because I hunger for control. He said, I'm burning out because I hunger for value. I burn out because I hunger for security. And I burn out because I hunger for acceptance. He recognized that his, his schedule, his time was being controlled by something more than that, by something inside of him. He had a quote um, from a pastor in Charlotte, actually, who said, we are busy because we try to do too many things. We do too many things because we say yes to too many people. We say yes to all these people because we want them to like us and we fear their disapproval. We overwork because that is the price tag on being esteemed. When we're not satisfied with our intrinsic gospel-afforded value, we must, we must, get it from those around us, or if not from the people around us, from something around us, um, we'll get it from. He said as a pastor, he realized what he was saying is, God, you are insufficient to build your church. Um, man, one of the most helpful things I heard when, um, when we started the church was Andy Stanley, huge church in, in Atlanta, was just a busy season in his life with his kids, felt like he's supposed to pastor this church, plant, plant this church. And he told God, if you can do it with 45 hours of my time, then we'll do this. But I think my family needs me for the rest of that time. And there was some freedom in that. Like what this says about our heart is a big thing. I was talking to Dan earlier um, today, actually, and we were talking about the coronavirus and how our schedule is out of whack. And and for some of us, we're busier than ever. For some of us, we're not. But because we're not in control of that, because we think our schedule can control some of these things, like we're emotionally out of whack because our, our time is out of whack from the ability of control that we can have over it in normal times. Uh, getting your life in order and loving your neighbor, like that starts with the gospel. All those things the guy said about control and value and security and acceptance, those all come from the gospel. When Jesus was on the cross, it looked like everything was out of control and all was lost, but God was in complete control of everything was going on. The gospel tells us that God is always in control. Our value is not in what we do for others or even what we do from God. Our value comes from the reality that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Um, his, the value he places on us is not based on anything we do for him, but it's reflected in what he did for us, that we're made in the image of God, and he loves us because he's our heavenly father, and that is where our fundamental core value has to come from. Our security is not in our ability to control the future, to build up a big enough IRA, to get enough 
promotions that you deem yourself irreplaceable at work. That's not where our security comes from. But knowing (laughs) that he is from everlasting to everlasting and time is in his hands and he is in control of things. And we will not always have the approval of the people around us. He tells us that, you know, but he is at the right hand of the father interceding on our behalf because he's, he's for us. No matter who is against us, he is always for us. Like it, that's where it starts. That's the gospel. Um, and our problem always stems from some form of unbelief that we don't really believe those things are true. And our faith in those things needs to, needs to grow. Uh, it, we grow by believing things that right now we're having a hard time believing but working through believing those things more, and that's through scripture and prayer and through community and whatever it is. And then that's how we change. That's how we change. And that's when we have a problem, I think for most of us, loving our neighbor well because of time, it's going to drill down to one of those areas. One, um, one, one a guy named Dallas Willard said, hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. And he said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. I mean, the degree to which the people that are tuned in this morning or whatever are, are hurry sick, you know, experience that is all over the place. I would guess that most of us suffer from it, you know, in, in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so I want to just make a few suggestions as I close here. There was, a, there was a, one of the podcasts that I put out there Um, was they talked about the rule of life. And that's not like rules to live by, more like a ruler. He said it's like a trellis into which your life grows. And and one of the things, he said a few things that really stuck out to me, a guy named John Mark Comer. He said they don't talk about goals in their household anymore because they didn't, and this is going to rub some of us the wrong way, some of you like, they didn't like the way that was shaping them, but just the habits that they have in life and how those habits are forming them. And I really, that really stuck with me. I thought, man, I bet our biggest habit for a lot of us is worry. And you don't think of worry as a habit, but it's a habit. It's a mental habit that shapes your life, you know, and it, it feeds hurry. And hurry can be another habit. He talked about, I talk about social media a lot. He said something that I hadn't heard someone say before. When it comes to social media and how Instagram and Facebook and whatever think about you, you are not the consumer of that product. You are the product. You're not, they don't think about you as a consumer. You're the product that they sell to advertisers. And the more people they get attached to whatever their platform is, the more money they can make selling you to advertisers because you're not the consumer, you're the product. That, that's true. That's why tech executives don't let their kids use social media and really limit their device time. And you can find that anywhere, you know? Um, be, and, and their incentive then is to get you hooked on whatever the thing is, to make it addictive. And that's, what's, that's what happens. And it's, it shapes us, you know? It shapes us. It leads to a culture that values busyness above almost everything else. I said this maybe a year ago that I think busyness is our highest value as a culture. And I say that because of how often when somebody asks, how are you doing? You say, oh man, I'm so busy. They track this in, I don't know how they do this, in holiday letters, what people say. And, and busy is the top thing that people say. And the amount of shame that you get by saying, yeah, I'm not very busy. Like what's projected on you is just, it's what our culture values, you know? And it's something that we have to, to war against. It connects with me, like not wanting to check my inbox. And when I do, feeling like I'm a loser because there's nothing I want to look at on my phone. Like it's, it's the air that we breathe. And at some point you have to decide which kingdom's values am I going to live by? Like the kingdom of our world or God's kingdom? Because God's kingdom is not a hurried place, but our world is a hurried place. Um, what habits, you know, can you can you break? What habits can you break that are forming you in the wrong way? And out of all this, I would pick one to either break or to make, you know, what habits can you make? And they start, they talked about, and I talk about this a lot, what you do first. You know, I heard a stat this week that 93% of us sleep with our phones 
on our nightstand right next to us. <laughs> I have put it across the room on my dresser. Um, this guy said he turns it off at like 8 or 8.30 and doesn't turn it on until 9 or 9.30 the next morning. I may start doing that. Uh, but when you do that, there is an emptiness that you feel because you're not engaging. And I still have a problem not letting it be because I'll check the weather, not letting it be the first thing that I engage in the morning. But what you put in first thing matters. One guy talked about how um, he has a gratitude journal and the first thing he does every morning is writes down three things to be grateful for. Man, what a great thing to engage your mind in first thing. And then he reads the Bible, he reads some scripture, and he writes down one thing that he picked out of that, one way that he feels like God's speaking to him, and then he spent some time with the Lord. That is a habit that will shape, it'll start to shape your life. Um, doing that alone, doing that as a family on a weekly basis will shape your life. Sabbath, I talk about this a lot. Leaving work, shutting it down at a certain time for a period of time will change your life. Joy, I think, is a habit. Like celebrating joy and just recognizing it and laughter, like those are habits. And neighbors are a habit. And so this, in this series, the next step in this with neighboring and time is spend an hour this week with your neighbors. Spend an hour with your neighbors. Carve it out like if you're in a home group, be accountable to your home group that you spend an hour it doesn't have to be all at once, but with your neighbors and see how God starts to use that. I'm going to finish with us a, the rest, a bit of the end of Psalm 90, which I read earlier, because it ends up being a prayer. And this is, this is what the psalmist writes. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Lord, satisfy us in the morning. <laughs> First thing, with your, let your love give us value and security and acceptance and approval. Let your love be the thing that gives that to us that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Lord, would you do that for us? Would, you, would we be satisfied with your love above everything else in our lives and would that shape us? Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, to us. Let us see your work and your glorious power to our children, Lord. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Father, we recognize you as Lord of our time. Father, would we surrender our time to you? Would we surrender our schedule to you? Would we recognize the gift that it is and that you are in control and if we don't get everything done, you are still in control? And would we would we surrender it to you for the sake of the people that you have put around us, that you have made in your image, that you have gone to the cross for because you love them so much, whether they be our neighbors or our parents or our coworkers or our children or our spouses. Lord, would we use the time you've given us to love the people around us well. We love you and pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was rested my life began dash was redeemed only beauty remained my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me new now. Begins with you. Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully bore. 
He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down. displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoices, though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested in my is over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Is your endless love pouring down on us? You have made Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. And there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. I've been set free, and Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need in Christ, my all in all joy in my salvation and this hope will never fail for heaven is our hope through every storm my soul will sing Jesus is here to God be the glory in Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Yes, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for Everything I need is in you. 
everything I need. And I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me. The world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. Yes, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need, yes, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Well, again, thank you for joining us this morning. May you love your neighbor this week. May you give of your time. Know that we love you. We're here to serve you as your church. If there's anything you need, reach out. But continue to shine your light. Shine your joy for all around you to see. So we love you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.